hi, I'm Meredith. I'm a dietitian. I'm not your dietitian. So please talk to your own personal healthcare provider before you make any changes to your nutrition, your diet, your supplements, your lifestyle. Please excuse my voice. Um, I have a cold, but I didn't wait to record this video because I promised to share about this in the vitamin A toxicity group on Facebook. Um, and so I didn't want to delay. And you can find the link to that group in the description under this video. So this video is about the fact that vitamin A toxicity, I believe, is actually caused by anhydroretinol. Anhydroretinol is a metabolic byproduct of bad vitamin A metabolism, and it's also found in small amounts or sometimes large amounts in our food supply, depending on the conditions that foods that have vitamin A in them are stored. And so I don't want to scare people about vitamin A rich foods necessarily. Um, I think that the general population can tolerate a small amount of this anhydroretinol. I think that there are just vulnerable people who don't tolerate it. And then I think the major issue is that we make anhydroretinol in our bodies, depending on certain conditions. So um, I want to start, though, with a little bit about vitamin A. So some basic knowledge about vitamin A. We eat vitamin A in two different forms. We eat it in the form of beta carotene, or we eat it in the form of retinal esters. And then there's also apocarotinols that we can get from our diet. And then there's things that aren't listed here like lutein and zeaxanthin. I'm actually gonna look into those too um, to see, cause some people don't tolerate lutein. <laughs> so I wanna, I wanna figure that out, but I decided to make this video a bit faster. So retinal esters are found in animal products and we use, when we're digesting them, we, we digest away the fat, this little R thing over here is the fat. So we digest away the fat and then Free retinol is absorbed into the intestinal tract, but in our bodies, when we want to have retinol available, we use an enzyme called um, retinol ester hydrolase, and that gets the retinol off of the lipid that it's stored on. And then when we want to store retinol, we use lecithin retinol acetyltransferase. And this is this slide is what I know about vitamin A metabolism or what I knew about it from being a dietitian for 23 years. And so it's real good information that's solid, right? Okay, so retinol goes to retinol aldehyde. Um, in the body, we use the enzyme retinol dehydrogenase or also alcohol dehydrogenase because retinol is a primary alcohol. Uh, um, and so it has, has this hydroxyl radical on the end here, or not, it's not a radical. When it's attached to something, it's not a radical. So it has a hydroxyl group and um, that makes it an alcohol. It's a primary alcohol. Um, and then retinol aldehyde is an aldehyde form of retinol. And um, we can take retinol aldehyde and convert it back into retinol with retinal reductase, and that's NADH dependent. Um, so if there's a lot of NADH in the cell, it may be that retinal aldehyde could go to retinol a bit easier. Um, retinal aldehyde is converted into retinoic acid by ALDH1A1 or um, retinal aldehyde dehydrogenase, and that's NAD dependent as well. And then there's a backup enzyme for when our NAD levels aren't available, and that's AOX. And that enzyme is um, that's actually supposed to be an O there. <laughs> it's mol molybdenum dependent, so it's MO. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm not going to stop the recording to fix the slide, but this should be an MO. And then um, retinoic acid is metabolized away by CYP26, and it requires NADPH, and NADPH um, is recycled in energy production, but it's also made by the pentose phosphate shunt pathway. And so um, this is thiamine dependent if you're struggling with NADPH. So you won't be able to run your CYP26 to get rid of retinoic acid if you have low thiamine status potentially. And then also CYP26 is an iron 
enzyme, it has heme in it. And so if you're bad at making heme, there's people who are bad at making heme, or if you're very iron deficient, you might struggle with your CYP enzymes. And so then you might have an accumulation of retinoic acid. Um, and I, I also thought that this was the major cause of Zoe's issues was broken down pathways because of NAD. I felt like her NAD was too low, so she was staying at retinol or sometimes being stuck at retinol aldehyde. And I thought that maybe she wasn't excreting retinoic acid some. And those things are all still possible. I'm not saying that these, these pathways can't be broken and I'm not exonerating all of these metabolites that can accumulate. Um, so let's go on to beta carotene. So we have beta carotene here and that comes from vegetables and beta carotene is converted to retinal aldehyde by beta carotene um, monooxygenase. And also you can use BCO1 or there's another enzyme, BCO2, and I'll show that in a, in a future slide, but BCO2 and BCO1. If you have a slow BCO1, you don't make much retinal aldehyde. Um, and BCO2 can be a backup for BCO1 and it helps to make apocarotinols. So, um, so yeah, so that's where we are. <laughs> Um, one thing to know is that you can convert beta carotene into retinal aldehyde and then go back to retinol. It is possible. You can do that. Your body, kinetically speaking, though, doesn't really like to make retinol. It really likes to move retinaldehyde forward to retinoic acid. Something else you need to know is you cannot take retinoic acid and make retinaldehyde and retinol. It's an irreversible reaction. So once you get to retinoic acid, you can't go back. You can't make retinol out of it. Okay. okay. Well, the only way it can go is excretion. We can excrete it through our bile acid. So when Zoe was first diagnosed with hypervitaminosis A, and I wouldn't even say diagnosed um, like officially because I noticed it. I'm a dietitian, so I diagnosed her with it, but it's it was quite hard for me to get people on board to help me out with it. Um, which is fine. The metabolic genetics doctor said, you got this mom, you're a dietitian. <laughs> so I have it. <laughs> so anyway, um, I joined the vitamin A toxicity group, lovely group, lots of people willing to listen to my interesting hypotheses on how things are going down. Um, and so um, I met Jenny Jones, PhD, and Andrew Baird, lovely people. And Jenny sent me this article and she's like, have you seen the vitamin A and retinoids as mitochondrial toxicants. And I'm like, no, send it to me. And she did. And I was horrified, like horrified. My poor child, all the things damaging her, that, that article really scared me. And, but they didn't, they still said in the article that they don't know the exact mechanism by which vitamin A elicits its deli delirious, I can't talk today, <laughs> deleterious effects. They don't know how. And, and they're supposing based on this article. So um, I took it to heart though. And I'm like, I got to work on her NAD metabolism because she is not making retinoic acid and not getting it out of her body. And that's the number one problem. And now I don't think so. Well, it's still a problem, but there's another problem. <laughs> okay. So um, this study shows that instead of retinol being bad, like it was supposed that retinol was horribly bad in the vitamin A toxicant paper, mitochondrial toxicant paper. This study um, shows that retinol is an electron carrier in redox signaling. So it helps the cells to be able to, to manage reactive oxygen species. And then in this article, it says another retinol metabolite and hydroretinol was discovered owing to its capability to compromise cell survival. That's interesting, right? Do you see? Okay, so then, um, how, oh, I have to tell you how I came across this article. So I came across this article because Theo, um, Car I think it's Carmela is how you say her last name. She's a friend of mine from the vitamin A toxicity group. And I've kind of helped her out on the side just for, you know, cause I care about people. And she said, you need to listen to this podcast because I'm wondering your opinion on what this guy is saying that you need retinol and you need to take cod liver oil. So you have enough retinol so that your cells can work properly. So I listened to the podcast and, um, you know, kind of disgruntled <laughs> to be honest. I was like, fine, I'll listen to it. Not at Theo, but at the people in the podcast. 
Um, they were all talking about their fish oil, cod liver oil. And I won't name who it is because I don't want to be controversial. Um, and then he mentioned this article and I, I found the article and I read it and I'm like, yeah, but what about anhydro retinol? Like we can't just exonerate retinol when there's an obvious thing right here, a, a metabolite that could be causing a problem. And so I started researching about anhydro retinol and I found this article, Quantum Chemistry Rules Retinoid Biology. And what this article shows, and I'll show a slide in just a bit, it shows that there is a signaling molecule called PKC delta that is in the mitochondria that tells the cell whether or not to keep energy metabolism on or to turn it off. And if you put, instead of retinol into this, this signalome, they call it a signalome, then anhydroretinol irre irreversibly activates PKC delta. That's a bad thing. We can't just keep energy metabolism on because if energy metabolism stays on, then reactive oxygen species form. And they'll shut down the mitochondria. It'll shut down different pathways to keep your body from becoming toxic. And so it's the elongated conjugated double bond system that limits the energy quantum absorbed by the um, resonance energy transfer. That's very technical, but basically the double bonds that are on retinol are good and the double bonds that are on anhydro retinol are bad. Okay. And so what happens is that PKC delta is in the on position when you have anhydro retinol in it, and that causes harmful levels of reactive oxygen species. And so physiological levels of retinol, having a little bit of fresh retinol, but we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, how that could go wrong, but having some fresh retinol, that not anhydro retinol can buffer the cytotoxicity and help you. Okay. And so many people have gone on low vitamin A diets and they've had a honeymoon effect and felt really good for a little bit. Um, me included, my low vitamin A diet was because I stopped supplements and then I eat vitamin A, but I don't eat a ton. I've never have. Um, and so I was, I also suffered from some crazy detox effects, <laughs> but, um, I, as I do future videos, I can explain that. And um, intriguingly, apocarotinoids, um, they also can have anhydro retinol like features. I'm not saying that beta carotene necessarily is horrible for us, but it really matters whether or not you have a slow BCO1 enzyme or not. Because if your BCO1 enzyme is slow, then your BCO2 enzyme has to take up uh, the slack. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Okay. So why did this become a thing? Why did I all of a sudden be like, it's anhydro retinol? Well, I have one client and his mom has given me permission to share. His name is Oasis and he's been with me for over a year. He was started on valproic acid four years ago uh, for seizures. And I believe his seizures were actually caused by anhydro retinol, looking back, you know, hindsight. So valproic acid causes vitamin A toxicity in liver because it downregulates this thing called retinal binding protein four, which is supposed to move the vitamin A throughout the entire body. So the retinol builds up in the liver. And then when you exceed the capacity of the liver, that's when you start seeing dysfunction of the liver. And so um, you can see here this year, his AST and ALT went sky high. Well, one thing you have to know is that while you're on valproic acid, it's, it's both the the poison in the antidote because valproic acid makes this thing called GABA and GABA helps to mop up all the reactive oxygen species by upregulating enzymes that help to deal with the damage, but it doesn't fix the underlying problem. The underlying problem is there's still way too much vitamin A on board in the liver. And so as soon as you remove the valproic acid, then you can see the, the cytotoxicity. And so these are his labs um, after he got off of valproic acid and it's hindsight that we realized that the valproic acid was helping to keep him from dying from the toxic levels of vitamin A in his body. And so, um, so liver enzymes were high and then he also cannot make platelets. And we thought this was potentially because of the valproic acid, but because that causes that, because it inhibits the ability of the body to make retinoic acid. You need retinoic acid to make new platelets. 
But in actuality, I think that um, his, uh, Oasis has a genetic issue called CAPCB, and that makes him vulnerable to the effects of an anhydro retinol. So a few weeks ago, his mom was telling me how um, since starting the drug zonisamide procedures, and zonisamide makes it so that it, it uses the AOX enzyme I talked about, that's the backup enzyme for making retinoic acid. So he started zonis zonisamide and he stopped making retinoic acid pretty much completely based on all these things that I know going on in this pathway. And he got really sick. Like he's dying from retinoic acid deficiency, not toxicity. He's just not making any. And so he can't heal his skin. And um, so he's, he's also having problems with hair loss and poor wound healing and his immune system isn't functioning. He keeps getting sick. So we need some retinoic acid. Um, okay, so I decided to search anhydroretinol and CAPCB. Um, CAPCB is, um, actually I've searched F-actin. F-actin is what CAPCB makes, okay? So here's the gene. This is from um, gene card, and this is CAPCB. And what it does is it makes F-actin. And so this shows where... CAPC B gene is located and you can see that it's, you need it in the cytosol, the cytoskeleton, um, extracellular, the nucleus, and it kind of goes on and even in the mitochondria. And what F actin does is it stabilizes cells. Okay. And so what happened to Oasis is that F actin, he has a vulnerable F actin, like he doesn't make it right. And F actin functions as a um, target for retro retinoids and hydro retinol. If you have a bad effect, F actin will trigger cell death. So Oasis is always triggering cell death. That's not good. That's not good. And then on top of that, the anhydro, the, the damaged cells create reactive oxygen species. And then that leads to the production of anhydroretinol as well. And so he likely was getting the anhydroretinol from his enteral nutrition formula um, because of the degradation of it over time and some of the, the stuff that's added to it, it could be triggering the, you know, the retinol after it comes out of the lipid, it will basically interact with these acids and then it becomes anhydroretinol. And so his body couldn't tolerate it. Some people can, I'm not saying that this is happening to everyone, but there's vulnerable people out there. So, um, so here in the study, they found that the retro retinoids, metabolites of vitamin A um, are, are actually, um, they cause the, the apoptosis of the cells via F-actin, okay? So, oh, I need to say one more thing about that. Um, so, they could rescue the cells with a thing called BCL2. And BCL2 is something that our bodies, when we're under reactive oxygen species attack, our bodies will make GABA, okay? And GABA will, will trigger the increase in BCL2 to save the cell from dying. And so if you don't make GABA, you cannot stop the cell from dying from anhydroretinol. Again, if you have a bad actin protein, but I honestly, um, I'll show you that it doesn't matter um, about if your F-actin is okay or not, because the anhydroretinol itself will kill your cell through the mitochondria, through reactive oxygen species. <laughs> I'm only laughing because I'm uncomfortable. Um, okay, so why are people with intellectual disability, they're the unfortunate model for um, AR toxicity, anhydroretinol toxicity. It's because they have broken pathways. And so they're more vulnerable at an early age, whereas the rest of us start to have more issues as we get older, because as we age, the accumulation of reactive oxygen species over time makes us more vulnerable in general. And then some of us do have genetic SNPs like polymorphisms and genes for specific things. Like you might have MTHFR or you um, like C677T or you, you might have a slow calm T. There's lots of things that can go into this pathway. So Oasis has CAPCB deletion. So that makes his F-actin vulnerable. Um, Zoe has MBD5 deletion that causes an NMDA receptor deficiency. I think that's related because if you can't get calcium into the cells, 
um, then you can't open the straw six door and allow fresh retinol in. And the only retinol that is able to go in and out of the cell would be di by diffusion. And so it, it makes her really bad at exporting retinol from the cell and that becomes a problem. So um, she also has glutathione deficiency from her MVD5 deletion. She has white Sutton syndrome and non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And this makes her a bad maker of NAD. She can't make NAD very well in her body. Um, another client that I have that I won't do the full name has MVD5 deletion. And we're trying to get the doctors on board to help with this. Um, another client, O, has 22Q11.2 duplication, and that causes NMDA receptor malfunction. Um, J has Down syndrome, and it causes increased interferon gamma receptors, which would overactivate the IDO kynurin pathway, and that can induce a B6 and B2 deficiency, and also the byproducts block metabolism. So there's many more people that I've seen over the past few years that have genetic predisposition for not being able to metabolize um, or to deal with anhydroretinol and they become toxic. And it looks like vitamin A toxicity because they'll have very high serum levels of vitamin A um, or they'll just have signs of retinoic acid deficiency that we've always said is also the sign of vitamin A toxicity. Funny, it's because it's about metabolism. <laughs> we have to make retinoic acid. We have to excrete retinoic acid. So it's a metabolism thing. So now, after reading all those articles, I, I updated this particular slide. And so what I have found that is that um, beta carotene is converted by BCO2 in the mitochondria to beta apoten carotenol. And this is, so if you have a slow BCO1 enzyme, the beta carotene will enter into your cells, it will get into your mitochondria, and the beta carotene will kill your mitochondria. The whole idea that eating as much beta carotene as you want is okay for your body is kind of an old school idea because we know that carotenoids can be toxic. If your child is orange, stop giving them carrots. I'm not kidding. Like, I'm serious. If they're orange and they have orange calluses like me, I have an orange callus, do not overfeed them beta carotene. They probably have a slow BCO1. And the problem with that is that they have a slow BCO1, they're dependent on BCO2. And BCO2 specifically in the mitochondria makes beta apo 10 carotenol. And this, as long as you have plenty of healthy, fresh retinol on board, can give your heart a little energy boost. And then it goes back to normal. So you might become a really fit athlete if you have a BCO2, a slow BCO1 enzyme, as long as you have healthy retinol in your body to buffer this. You have to have healthy retinol. So interestingly, if you're in a high reactive oxygen species state, then you can make beta apoten carotenol from retinol or actually from retinol aldehyde or retinoic acid. And the reference for that is right here. So if you're on a low vitamin A diet and you're not getting any fresh retinol in, your your energy metabolism requires retinol to work properly and to not make reactive oxygen species. So when you start to make reaction, reactive oxygen species, then here's what happens. Your body will take retinoic acid and you'll have that. So the reason why people still have retinoic acid when they're on a low vitamin A diet is because they eat meat and meat contains retinoic acid. And retinoic acid is absorbed and it goes straight to the liver. And because it goes through the portal vein, because it's a small molecule, it doesn't have to be packaged on a chylomicrons. It goes straight to the liver, which is not bad. We need that. But the problem is, is that if you're not eating any retinol, your body will automatically, in my opinion, make some beta, beta apo 10 carotenol to try to fix your, your energy metabolism, your pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Um, and then if you don't have retinol on board, then you probably are stuck in the same situation. We definitely need studies on this. Okay, so, so we take retinol and we turn it into anhydroretinol either in our gut or in our cells or we eat it. So those are the three ways. So oxidative stress, not good, makes beta apoten carotenol only good if you have fresh retinol. And, and oh, one more thing, beta 
beta apotencarotenol inhibits CYP26. So that causes an increase in retinoic acid. And as retinoic acid goes up, it inhibits ALDH. And so that leads to an increase in retinal aldehyde from any um, beta carotene that you happen to eat. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot to this and I'll be unpackaging it in multiple videos, but um, okay. So moving on, we know that anhydroretinol is a problem. Okay, so let's look at the cell and see why it's the, the big problem here. So this is a healthy cell, um, and I have a whole video that I'm going to record on the massive destruction because I went through the pathways and I drew it all out, but I didn't want to overwhelm people with that first video. So I'm just going to say here, you have this signalosome, and it's PKC delta, and it requires retinol. Okay, so this is what happens normally. The This signalosome senses the cellular energy level, and when the electron levels get high in the sorry, intermembrane space of the mitochondria, then this signals for PD, PDK2, which is um, pyruvate, no, sorry, I'm sorry. So it's um, it's a dehydrogenase kinase. I actually think it is pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. And so it um, it comes along and it removes a phosphate group from thiamine, and that will turn off PDHC. So if you in inhibit this, then the enzyme stays on. Okay. And so what the PKC delta um, signalone's job is to turn off PD, PDK2, turn it on and off and on and off based on how much energy production is happening in the cell. So the cell doesn't go overboard and produce too much energy because if the cell goes overboard and produces too many electrons, then you create superoxide. So um, here is this, this is from the quantum, um, quantum mechanics paper, and it shows that if you put in anhydroretinol into PKC delta, it remains active. But if you have plenty of fresh retinol and you mix that in with anhydroretinol, then you just have an on extended phase. So it's like an energy boost for the cell. So having no retinol is a bad thing. We need the retinol to buffer the anhydroretinol that we all consume every day. It's in our diet. We also make a little bit of it probably. So the problem is when we get too much anhydroretinol compared to retinol. And also the apocarotinols, those are suspect too, especially that um, apo beta 10, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Okay, so this is the end game, and it's in another video. So this is the end game. This is what happens when the reactive oxygen species gets out of control, and there's multiple vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Basically, it leads to excessive amounts of reactive oxygen species, and then the cytochrome um, C is exported from the inter intermembrane space, and that leads to caspase activation, and the entire cell dies. I, I literally, like, died while I was watching this. Um, so, okay, so this is what I've made in the past three days to explain what is happening to people, and I will put this on my blog so that you have access to it, and I will go over it in a future video, but it's so extensive that it's gonna need major unpacking. So just trust me on this, that I will make future videos, okay? So um, I wanna get to though, the sources of anhydroretinol and the risk of um, risk for the vulnerable, okay? So the first source is vitamin A supplements. Um, vitamin A acetate is the worst because all you need is acetate and retinol, because retinol can be its own primary alcohol. And then those two things together make anhydroretinol. And so these supplements typically have anhydroretinol in them um, in varying amounts. The lowest I saw was like 3%. So um, again, if you're a vulnerable person, that could be a breaker for you. 
vitamin A fortified dairy products, because some of those also probably contain anhydroretinol. They usually have vitamin A palmitate in them. Um, so especially fat-free milk. Um, and if it degrades, then the retinol is free inside the milk. And if it's exposed to UV light, then you have a problem. So always look for the milk that's in the totally dark container, not the opaque container. Um, baby formulas, vitamin A degrades out of palmitic acid as time goes on. That's why baby formulas have way above the RDA and usually above the UL for if you consume 24 ounces of formula, because the companies know that the vitamin A degrades. And so when that when the retinol is sitting free inside of the formula, and then you add it to liquid, you shake it up in the bottle and you have it sitting out. Well, retinol is a primary alcohol itself and ultraviolet light can interact with an alcohol in retinol and make anhydroretinol. And so if you are feeding your baby formula, one thing you can do to mitigate this is to get bottles that aren't clear. That, yeah, or put like something around the bottle, maybe put something around tape, something, maybe tape your bottles with painter's tape. I don't know, just like try to keep your baby's formula from not being exposed to light for more than 15 minutes because that's what causes it. Um, enteral nutrition formulas and oral nutrition beverages that are fortified with vitamin A, they can contain AR. And again, some people can handle it, small amounts, some people can't. A shelf stable products fortified with vitamin A that contains AR because when they make the vitamin A to add to supplement, to add to foods, some of it will be AR. And as um, foods sit on the shelf, they, the vitamin A degrades too. So, all right. So skincare products, that's a big problem. Don't wear anything with retinol in it because as soon as your skin is exposed to light, you make anhydroretinol in your skin. You don't want that. So here's a, um, this shows how skincare products, and then also this could happen, I think, with, with the food items too. Um, so you have your retinal palmitate and you can leave it um, if there's an alcohol involved, because you you know you have to have a little alcohol, but again, retinol is an alcohol as well. So um, if it's in UV light, UVA at 365 nanometers, which is even in our LED lights, um, that's for 15 minutes, you get anhydro retinol. So the biggest source of anhydroretinol, I think though, is formation in the gut before absorption. I think it can be formed in the gut um, because people either are drinking alcohol or they have candida or they're taking Saccharomyces boulardii supplements, which also Saccharomyces loves to make alcohol. So if you have alcohol and an acid, so in your stomach, um, if you have acid in your stomach, um, we all do, <laughs> then when you eat the vitamin A food, an alcohol and an acid will make anhydroretinol. I actually think my daughter, her candida is so bad, it's coming out of her G-tube now. I believe that every bit of vitamin A that she consumes, she turns into anhydroretinol. So it's a very bad situation and it's hard to get candida treated um, safely. Okay, so formation in the body, that happens during metabolism. So when a person is in ketosis and they have a high retinol load, you have acetic acid and retinol. So you make anhydroretinol. I'll show that again in a bit. Cod liver oil, this is actually where anhydroretinol was discovered <laughs> because they found it in cod liver oil. So this is many people who are in our vitamin A toxicity support group, they were taking cod liver oil and that is where they started the cascade. They got anhydroretinol and it started a problem and it didn't stop and they're stuck in the pathway because all roads lead to anhydroretinol, but there's an escape plan. Okay, so um, freeze-dried liver, and hydroretinol. Liver in general, I am unsure, but just know that a quarter ounce of liver, one quarter ounce is the RDA for vitamin A for adult. And RDA meets 98% of the pop of 98% of the needs of the person who needs the most vitamin A. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about the RDA. Are you the person who needs the most vitamin A or, or are you the average person who needs like maybe 50%? So that's a good question, right? Not trying to scare us away from vitamin A because remember we need fresh retinol to run our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. We need it. Okay. All right. So 
this was a deep dive and I had to figure out how, how are we making this if it's happening? So when they make anhydroretinol in a lab, they, the temperature doesn't have to be super high if you're using alcohol and hydrochloric acid. It just has to be 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And in chemistry, as the temperature increases in a reaction, then you know the, the, it becomes easier for the reaction to happen. And so then the acid doesn't have to be as strong. So our body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And so what one study showed is that acetic acid, which has a pKa of just 4.8, not even a really strong acid. This is the acid that's found in apple cider vinegar. <laughs> so don't drink apple cider vinegar um, because acetic acid at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit will act as the acid and you can make anhydroretinol, okay? Because remember, retinol is a primary alcohol and this is ethanol, okay? So um, if you do not have the acid, um, so, so if you do not have like the alcohol on board, that kind of stuff, you don't have this going on, then the acidic environment, correcting that, would make retro retinol um, or rehydro retinol, okay? So the difference between these two molecules is anhydro retinol has no hydroxyl group and retro retinol or rehydro retinol has a hydroxyl group, okay? Um, so... Okay, so these are the acids that I suspect. Sulfuric acid. So um, this is sulfate. Um, I think that it's a potential issue if you're, you know, if you're struggling with sulfur metabolism and you're not able to, um, most of us, I think, are actually not making sulfate. Um, so I, I kind of want to exonerate sulfuric acid, but there are sulfates um, in our, our um, food supply. So maybe, right? Acetone, which is, um, it has a pKa of seven. It's, it's the, it's a similar to acetic acid. Like you, you, these, you make acetic acid into acetone in your body. I actually think that my daughter is really high in acetone. Um, she's, she's sick so much. Um, after looking at these metabolic pathways, I'm pretty sure hydrochloric acid has a pK of negative six. So it's a suspect. So if you have candida and you have alcohol in your stomach, or if you drank alcohol and you're eating a cheese tray, you made anhydrorenol. So maybe no alcohol and cheese mixed together. Um, selenic acid has a pK of negative three. Um, look for supplements that have sodium selenate in them, um, because that's an acid. Selenate is selenic acid. Um, so or, you know, it can I summarize that or whatever? It's like, it goes back and forth. Okay, and oxalic acid. Um, oxalic acid has a pKa of 1.25, and that's lower than acetic acid, which has been shown to make anhydroretinol at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So oxalic acid is also suspect. You can get this by making it in your body, and I'll do a video on that because you actually make it in your body when you're stuck in anhydroretinol. No joke. Um, and then ethylene glycol is polyethylene glycol. Um, it's found in Miralax. High dose vitamin C could do this because you degrade it to oxalic acid. And a B6 deficiency um, has been implicated in having high oxalates in the body, but um, from you know the glyoxalate pathway. But I honestly think that's part of it, but also that this pathway induces hyperoxaluria. It, it makes it happen. And I have a video on that too. So, or I will have one. Okay. So um, this is a study, vitamin A treatment induces apoptosis through an oxidant dependent activation of the mitochondrial pathway. And you can see here, the study was done at 34 degrees Celsius and um, the solvent was ethanol and the con controls didn't have a reaction to ethanol. So they exonerated ethanol as the problem. Um, it was definitely the retinol that caused the toxin toxic apoptosis because ethanol alone didn't do it. But no, what happened was they used 98 point, you know, around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And then they put ethanol into the system and they also gave um, the retinol. And then, you know, within the cell itself, it probably made some type of 
acid because we do in metabolism. Or there's another possibility is that the retinol was a liquid. And so when you add retinol with ethanol and ultraviolet light hits it, within 15 minutes, you make anhydroretinol. So what were they doing with their retinol supplement? Was it sitting on the counter? Because that's where I left my supplements or my, um, my reagents, whenever I was in grad school, I would just leave things that didn't require refrigeration, um, in the, you know, the refrigerator that doesn't have windows on it. I would just leave it sitting on the counter. So maybe they just gave them all anhydroretinol. Okay. Um, so vitamin A treatment induces apoptosis through an oxidant dependent activation of the mitochondrial pathway. And when you see the longer tech video, you will see that anhydroretinol does this by overactivating pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So retinol induced, I say this is anhydroretinol, anhydroretinol induced oxidant and time dependent imbalances of several mitochondrial parameters and cytochrome C release and caspase 37 activation leading to um, the cells to commit apoptosis. And this is anhydroretinol, not retinol. We see that you need retinol to run metabolism. You don't need anhydroretinol. Sorry, I'm getting really passionate because <laughs> it's killing my daughter. It's killing her. Okay, vitamin A depletion causes oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, and PARP1 dependent energy dep deprivation. So when the cells don't have vitamin A, they can't run energy metabolism, okay? And so that's bad. That leads to reactive oxygen species. We must have vitamin A in our diet. We have to have retinol, not tons, we have to have it. And so what happens in this study is that when they added anhydroretinol, it made it worse. And we know why, because that pyruvate dehydrogenase complex stays on and the reactive oxygen species build up and it kills the cell. So there's no ATP being formed and the NAD levels, they drop. And the activation of this, this enzyme PARP, it, PARP1 is supposed to help to neutralize the reactive oxygen species, but it's not happening because of multiple factors that I'll explain in a future video. <laughs> okay, so I think that we have a problem here with alcohol. And some of this has to do with the ability to use sulfate to make a thing called PAPS. And PAPS is needed to buffer alcohol in the body. It does not buffer retinol though. It doesn't. It only bu buffers the alcohol like ethanol. And so um, we make, like every day we make three grams of, of ethanol or alcohol just in digestion and we absorb that. And so if we don't have an ability to buffer this type of stuff in our body, then the ethanol is metabolized to acetaldehyde and then acetic acid. And then if you have elevated ethanol levels or any primary alcohol in your cells, then and you have acetic acid or acetate in your cells, then you're gonna make anhydroretinol. So I believe the reason why very high levels of high dose vitamin A with lots of retinol can cause a problem is because I believe that retinol can be the primary alcohol as well. And so you can't, you can't buffer retinol, how you control retinol in your body, because there's no sulfur transferase for, for PAPS to work on retinol. It only works on you know, ethanol um, and other alls that are in the body. Um, so how you buffer retinol is you bind it. So you have retinol binding protein and you have cellular retinol binding protein. So we have to control retinol to keep it from being a primary alcohol in the cell. And as soon as you make acetic acid and you have free retinol, you're done. You make anhydroretinol. Okay. Okay. So big problems here. Let's talk about those. AR is a toxin. We know that anhydroretinol is bad if you don't have retinol to buffer it, okay? Um, if you have acetic acid though, if you have an acid in the system, you're gonna make anhydroretinol. So not being in, in this position where you're making acetic acid or you know consuming things that make you make acetic acid is, is, is a goal. Um, anhydroretinol will be converted to rehydroretinol with the addition of water. Via acid catalyst, 
So it's okay to have an acid catalyst, but you need the absence of alcohol. So alcohol is the big thing here. We need to get rid of alcohol or buffer alcohol. And hydroretinol can never become retinol. It never turns back into retinol. It only becomes rehydroretinol. And that only has 7% function, likely because the double bonds have shifted. So it can't act like a normal sensor in the um, PKC delta. It's not doing the best job. We need fresh retinol. So I'm wondering how much ret um, anhydroretinol do we actually have? And how much rehydroretinol do we actually have? So if you have been a producer of anhydroretinol for a very long time and you make rehydroretinol, is that what retinol you stored? It's frightening, right? So you're dependent on fresh retinol from your diet if all the, the retinol in your body is stored as anhydroretinol. Or sorry, you can't store anhydro rehydroretinol. So I'm gonna explain now that you can't store anhydroretinol. So LRAT is lysithin retinol acyltransferase and it requires retinol to have a OH group, a hydroxyl group on it. And the enzyme uses phosphatidylcholine. So we focus a lot on LRAT. Make sure you get choline in because you wanna make sure that you have LRAT because LRAT will put, um, helps to put a, um, sorry, how am I saying it? It helps to package up the retinol so that it can be stored on cellular retinal binding protein, okay? So then a, a rat is acyl-CoA retinal acyl transferase, and it requires retinol to have an OH group too. So it works on any retinol not bound to CRBP. So it's kind of like your backup, one of your backups. Um, so because it has an acyl-CoA, it's pantothenic acid, um, it requires pantothenic acid. And when you have your PDHC enzyme, your pyruvate dehydrogenase complex enzyme turned on all the time from anhydroretinol, you become pantothenic acid deficient. Then you start making acetic acid because acetic acid becomes acyl-CoA, but only if there's a CoA. So I think everyone is pantothenic acid deficient. Um, then you have DGAT and that's acyl-CoA diacylglycerol o acyl transferase one. <laughs> And that deals with excess retinol and it requires pantothenic acid because again, it has this CoA, right? So where exactly do we store anhydroretinol? We don't, we don't store it. We can only store it if we convert it back to rehydroretinol. And to do that, we have to be able to buffer alcohol or not have alcohol in the system. <sighs> that means if retinol is a primary alcohol and it could be the actual alcohol that causes the problem, we need it to all be bound up, right? We don't want free retinol in the cell where it can act like a primary alcohol. It needs to be on cellular retinal binding protein. That's why very, very, very high vitamin A intake can cause a problem here um, because you exceed the capacity of the cell. It's the reason why Zoe's struggling because she has an NMDA receptor deficiency. So once her cells get full of retinol, she's struggling with exporting it back out onto retinal binding protein four. Um, so her serum A is high as well, but I think that is because the same reason she struggles to open the pore that allows vitamin A to go in and out. And I'll try to do a future video on that as well to explain the, the concept. Okay, so here's LRAT, and I just want to prove to you, here is the OH group, and here is phosphatidylcholine. So this is in eggs. It's in your choline supplement if you're against eggs. <laughs> but eggs are a good, nice package source of retinol um, that, you know, if you are eating free-range chicken eggs, that I got some chickens outside. <laughs> if you're eating that, they have fresh retinol in them. So I don't think eggs are, are bad. I think they're are, are saving. Or, and, in, and in the vitamin A toxicity support group, when people start eggs, their liver enzymes go down because the phosphatidylcholine restores cell membranes. But also I think it's because we allow LRAT to have what it needs to be able to package up retinol and put it on cellular retinol binding protein where it's supposed to be so that retinol doesn't end up being the primary alcohol. Okay, so anhydroretinol though, does not have that OH group. So you can't store it. LRAT won't work on it. You have to have 
the hydroxyl group, group available for it to be attached to phosphatidylcholine. So now let's look at DGAT, um, which will be similar to um, ARAT, okay? So again, when you are trying to add a fat to a fat, a fatty acid, okay, or it's actually the kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have a fatty acid here and then you have an almost triglyceride. And that's what DGAT usually does is it makes triglycerides. Oh, and by the way, when you're stuck in this pathway, you're busy with DGAT elsewhere because you're making lipids. That's fun. So you're tying up your DGAT. And DGAT, I believe, is the last straw. It's the last thing that will help you when your cells are too high in retinol. And so if you're busy making lipids in your liver because you're stuck in this pathway, and I believe it causes a methylfolate trap and it induces lipid generation or genesis. So if you're you're stuck in this pathway, your DGAT's tied up. You don't have your third enzyme available to take care of excess retinol. And then retinol will become the primary alcohol if it's just floating around in the cell unbound. Um, Jenny Jones likes to say a sword without a sheath. And that's what retinol becomes when you don't bind it. So DGAT also requires that your, your vitamin A have that hydroxyl group. And so here's retinol and anhydro retinol doesn't have that right? So you can't bind it. So here's my question. Is this why alcoholics have no liver stores of retinol at all? That's what studies show. When you become an alcoholic and you drink alcohol, you added alcohol to a system where there's already acetate because that happens in metabolism all the time. And so these people are consuming retinol, but they're making anhydro retinol and therefore they don't have liver stores. Shocking, right? So where exactly do we store anhydro retinol? We don't, we don't, we don't store it, except maybe we store it on PKC Delta since it can suck it up and that could deplete your pools of B PKC Delta. And guess what happens when you have lack of PKC Delta? Mass cell degranulation your bile acid stops being healthy and it gets thick. Future videos. I hate anhydro retinol. I used to hate vitamin A, but now I hate anhydro retinol. It's my nemesis. Okay, so retinol, um, sorry, rehydro retinol can be carried on RPP4 because rehydro retinol does have a hydroxyl group. You've added it back. And so um, it can be stored in CRB. P, cellular retinal binding protein, um, but, but anhydro retinol can't. And then we need to consider this, that studies show that rehydro retinol only has 7% function. So technically you're still vitamin A deficient when you've gotten yourself out of the anhydro retinol issue. You're still vitamin A deficient. You have all the signs of vitamin A deficiency because you're just barely functioning on rehydro retinol. So how do we detox anhydro retinol? One study showed that only 12 to 16% of a 24 milligram IV dose is excreted in bile within 10 hours. That's not very much. It's excreted as highly polar metabolites. Okay. So I think we actually do have to make rehydro retinol, and then it has to be been metabolized normally, like through retinal aldehyde and retinoic acid, even though it will still have the weird double bonds and it won't, you know, it won't do its job. It won't be able to be, um, very effective at ligand binding, like as retinoic acid, it won't be able to gene transcribe. And so people who have rehydro retinol are any, um, they might be a little bit more better off than anhydro retinol because anhydro retinol is so toxic, but rehydro retinol is not nourishing. And so eliminating vitamin A, fresh sources of vitamin A from your diet is the worst idea because then you have no fresh retinol. And hindsight, I, I wish that I had known this. Um, I'll tell my health story at some point, but it's not important. Okay. Um, okay. So let's get to the solutions that I've come up with. So I will, again, show you the future video of the cellular destruction. I kind of mapped it all out. It took hours, but I will make a video because it did take hours. <laughs> So these are micronutrients so, um, support for, um, and it, you could do this with food sources or supplements. Um, I am, unfortunately, I am 
um, when people ask me questions about food, I have to use chronometer to look it up <laughs> because I am not a foodie. I'm a pathway dietitian. I'm not a foodie. If you need someone who really knows food to go to the vitamin A toxicity support group and ask Andrew a question because he knows foods. He's really good at it. Like, yeah, I'm like, I don't know what that's in. Okay. So, um, I do know that bananas have pantothenic acid and I do know that freezing foods destroys pantothenic acid. So when you buy your meat from the store, which is normally an okay source of pantothenic acid, if it's been frozen, it destroyed the pantothenic acid. Oh, and microwaving destroys B12. So there you go. Careful. Okay. So you need the RDA for minerals at minimum, copper, zinc, selenium, manganese, um, mol molybdenum. I've been being schooled by one of my clients on how to say that. You need the MO to make, so you need all this to support your antioxidant system. Um, you might need to adjust it based on your own mineral status. So a lot of people will do like HM, HTMA or hair, like the hair testing. Um, um, I've had blood work done on myself, just like, you know, blood work, which, you know, may or may not be valid, but it might be good to get an idea of where you are from a mineral standpoint. I think that most people probably need 400 IUs of vitamin E. You know, the max dose for vitamin E is, um, I think it's 1500 IUs. I think that when you go very, very high on vitamin E, it, be, it can become pro-oxidant because you require vitamin C, here's slow release vitamin C, about 250 milligrams a day. Um, you require vitamin C to recycle it. And so if you can't recycle your vitamin E, then it's just oxidated and it's not good for your cells either. So don't go way high. Um, you need coenzyme Q10 about, uh, I'm, I'm guessing 100 milligrams. <laughs> this is a guess because I've never done this before. But in the studies where the, the rats were toxic on anhydroretinol, they rescued them with vitamin E and coenzyme Q10 that, that rescued it. The reason why is coenzyme Q10 mops up the excess electrons that are in the, um, in the inner membrane space, it, it mops them up. And then the vitamin E, um, it stops the, there's, there ends up being a hydroxyl radical and it stops that because the hydroxyl radical is what does the worst damage to the lipid membranes. It makes cytochrome C leave the, the lipid membrane. So you definitely need vitamin E and coenzyme Q10. Um, you either need to eat a bit of vitamin C throughout the day or get slow release vitamin C, maybe about 250 milligrams per day. When you go higher on vitamin C, you can end up making too much hydrogen peroxide in your body. And that's part of this pathway too. So you don't want to add to your hydro hydrogen peroxide load. You don't want to be making, degrading it to oxalates. So, um, and then also vitamin C in high doses can inhibit um, aldehyde dehydrogenase. So it can make you not be able to make retinoic acid. So you don't want that because you have to make retinoic acid before you can get vitamin A out of your body if you think that your load is too high. Um, so you need pantothenic acid because as I went through the pathways, I, I saw that pantothenic acid um, was likely severely depleted. So you need that. You want to avoid a B complex because B complexes are notorious for having insane amounts of biotin and biotin inhibits the absorption of pantothenic acid. All three of these pantothenic acid, biotin, and lipoate all compete for absorption. So I would even say if you're taking pantothenic acid, don't take it with your eggs because your eggs have biotin, like hundred percent of the daily value of, of biotin in eggs, I think. You'd have to ask Andrew <laughs> or to look on chronometer, but, but biotin is important in vitamin A metabolism. It can rescue um, animals from vitamin A toxicity. And this is why biotin is a, it's like a little blocker for the straw six pore. So it helps to regulate the influx and efflux of vitamin A through the cells. Now retinol and retinoic acid can diffuse through the cell um, by simple diffusion based on concentration gradients, but, um, you, you really, our bodies love to use that straw six pore and biotin is an important component of that. So you require biotin, um, B12 and folate. Um, the reason why this is, is because people are getting stuck. One way people are getting stuck in this pathway is from B12 and folate deficiency. And that's inducing a vitamin B6 deficiency, a functional deficiency. You can watch my video on ALDH7A1, where I really implicate nitric oxide in, in this pathway. Also, hydrogen peroxide is now implicated in this pathway, too, of causing a functional B6 deficiency. But if you're B12 or folate deficient, it's 
it's the same thing. Like you're going to end up using BHMT, which requires betaine. And then if you don't eat betaine, then you're going to make it. And that causes the B6 deficiency. You want to avoid folic, folic acid, even in foods that are fortified, because folic acid um, can block your ability to use folate in your body. A uh, folinic acid um, or a 5-methylfolate seems to be better, but be aware if you start to have gout, it's your folinic acid. Sorry. <laughs> um, so you might switch to 5-methylfolate. Um, if you have, um, the, the only negative effect of 5-methylfolate is that you might make more lipids. Um, if you're folate deficient, it probably saved you from fatty liver disease this whole time. Fun fact. <laughs> So, um, okay, benthotimine, that's a thiamine. Um, It's like a thiamine supplement that's supposedly like fat soluble. I think it is mostly, but um, why I choose benthotimine is because benthotimine has been shown to downregulate nitric oxide synthase. And so um, it, it does it through downregulating nuclear factor kappa B. So INOS will go down and nitric oxide is really bad in this pathway. It causes the functional B6 deficiency. So benfotiamine can help. I do not think that benfotiamine restores normal PDHC activity. I think it remains pathogenic. Um, so it doesn't recover your, your pyruvate to acetylcholate. But what it does do is it helps you with your pentose phosphate shunt pathway. So that gives you NADPH and you need the NADPH to be able to recycle glutathione. Without NADPH, you can't recycle glutathione. So um, yeah, benfotiamine. And ironically, I took that for a couple of years and I had a really good experience. Like I felt so good on it. I stopped it recently because I got a little scared about it that maybe I was causing problems with my nitric oxide levels and I wasn't fighting off like fungal infections. And, um, and I went downhill very fast because I couldn't recycle glutathione anymore is my opinion on that. So benfotiamine, love it. Um, and it's up to you on dosing, you know, just do you however much makes you feel good because, you know, we're all individuals. Um, I think the max dose that they do in the high dose thymine groups, like 300, I think. I think that's a lot though. Okay. So next, Epsom salt baths to help with PAPS. So PAPS, um, mm, I don't know why I wrote this, pyruvate carboxylase. Um, yeah. Something, oh, I think maybe apps inhibits pyruvate carboxylase. I have to go back and look. Sorry, brains are running a little, so I am sick. <laughs> okay, so Epsom salt baths help to get sulfate into your body. You need sulfate. And in this pathway, people aren't making sulfate. They're either struggling with not having B6 to go from cysteine to methionine. I'm sorry, wrong way. They're struggling with going from cysteine down to making sulfate. Okay. And so they're becoming sulfate deficient and then they can't run this enzyme called PAPS. And I'll have a future video on that. And, um, or it's a molecule actually, like a, a thing that you make PAPS and PAPS helps to buffer alcohol. That's what we need. We need PAPS. So if you do Epsom salt baths, that helps you to get the sulfate into your body so that you can make PAPS. And so it's very helpful to do Epsom salt. Um, inside of our bodies in our mitochondria, where we usually take sulfite and we make um, we make um, sulfate out of it, that enzyme becomes toxic and you make sulfite radicals and it causes nerve damage and neurological damage and potentially seizures. So yeah, avoid sulfite foods. I think that I have that on the slide, but if I don't avoid sulfites, so, you know, wine and um, things that have sulfite added to it, like pickles and jellies and stuff like that, check your labels. All right, you want to monitor for acidosis with a healthcare practitioner and treat if you're able to. Um, because if you're in acidosis, there's a couple of things that happen. One, and I don't have it listed here, but one, you, you're not going to be able to make glutathione um, because you won't be able to get cysteine into the cells. And cysteine is a limiting factor in making glutathione. Um, you want to avoid citrate for acidosis. So not potassium citrate, um, no magnesium citrates. Um, usually citrate can help acidosis, but there's too much citrate going on in the system um, and it's going to lead to more acidosis um, or more lipid production. Preferably you would use potassium bicarbonate or sodium bicarbonate to restore your pH levels. 
And you want to take these away from meals because sometimes they can interfere with um, mineral absorption, but potassium bicarbonate helps with iron absorption. It actually upregulates it. Um, so one more thing about acidosis is I, I think that I don't have a video on this in the future. I think that acidosis messes with our first pass ability. And I call first pass is when we eat retinol, um, retinol is packaged into chylomicrons and it it's emptied in next to the heart and it spreads through the whole body. And, and the body gets a chance at retinol first, like all the peripheral tissues. And then if, if the peripheral tissues don't uptake retinol, the chylomicron will take it back to the liver and it's stored in the liver. If you're in acidosis, then you're likely insulin resistance in, in your like your enzymes that help to get the um, triglycerides out of the chylomicrons. Those aren't working correctly. And so you have a hard time uptaking lipids from a, you know, we call it postprandial, like after a meal, you don't really uptake the lipids into the peripheral tissues. And the problem is, is that vitamin A seems to like be packed in really, really tight and little to protect it. So if you're not getting your lipids out of your chylomicrons efficiently, then you never get to the vitamin A. And so all your peripheral cells would be deficient in vitamin A, potentially. So getting out of acidosis is super important. Um, so binders. Um, so, I mean, it's possible we could use binders to not reabsorb um, anhydroretinol, but also that might be preventing the absorption of retinoic acid from animal proteins um, or from the retino, like if we excrete any. I, I don't know. I'm kind of, I don't know. I don't know. I do let my my daughter eat fiber, which is a binder. So I just, I'm, I'm unsure about using binders in this situation, especially if you are um, on a very, very low vitamin A diet, maybe you would need to re reabsorb some of your retinoic acid. I don't know. I don't know. I guess you use binders and hopefully, yeah, that's up to you. Or maybe I'll study it some more and I'll come up with a future video. So I'm like iffy on it is what I'm saying. But I think a lot of people have had good experience with binders. So, okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, so you, okay. After you make sure that you have all of your minerals good, this is important. Make sure that you have copper, zinc, and selenium. And, um, and I would probably also say the, um, the molybdenum, molybdenum, I don't know. I'm really bad at that. Okay. So, um, then you would start betaine to restore B6 in your transsulfuration pathways. I think this led to my downfall because when you restore B6, you restore your ability to make GABA and GABA upregulates all of your antioxidant enzymes. And so you clean your liver up. It's a beautiful moment. You have a honeymoon. It feels so good with betaine, but people who are, are betaine sensitive, I think that that's what's going on is that they're upregulating their GABA, but they're deficient in these things. There are cofactors for making, for using like glutathione, um, peroxidase and um, superoxide dismutase. I think that they're struggling because they don't have the cofactors. And so then that just leads to de further depletion of these. Um, and for me, it ended up with like severe migraines to the point where I have some damage in my brain. That's why I'm crazy. No, I'm kidding. Well, I am a little crazy, but okay. So treats, um, the next thing you need to do is treat candida. Okay. Because candida happens in your esophagus, in your stomach, especially if you're on antihistamines, antihistamines cause esophageal and stomach candida. And if you have candida making alcohol in your stomach, it combines with hydrochloric acid. And then every time that you eat a vitamin A rich food, you have potential of making anhydroretinol. I know that's what happened to Zoe. Okay. She's just drunk all the time. Just to be honest, she's drunk on her own metabolites. Um, and, and, um, let's see. Also, um, you want to treat sulfur eating bacteria. This is opposite. I think of the recommendation for most people. Um, they say, oh, oh, let's give people the bacteria that eat sulfur so that they stop having SIBO symptoms. Well, I agree with Greg Nye's theory that Jenny Jones got me stuck on that SIBO is actually your body trying to compensate for the fact that you don't make your own hydrogen sulfide. So we don't want bacteria to eat our sulfur. We want to absorb it. 
we want to get it into our body to make PAPs. So stay away from things like Bacillus subtilis. Um, that's a spore-based probiotic and it helps with SIBO, but it doesn't treat the underlying issue. And I think that's sulfate deficiency. Um, liposomal glutathione, there's a big controversy about whether you should take glutathione or not. You should not take regular glutathione because candida love that stuff. Liposomal glutathione, possibly better. Um, so, so the thing is, is that if you take liposomal glutathione and people are saying, telling me that it's in the, the oxidized form, um, the oxidized form of liposomal glutathione turns on the cystathione B synthase enzyme so that it's, so that you convert more cysteine to glutathione. So it upregulates that enzyme. So that could be good if your B6 is restored that would be a good thing. And you would start making your own glutathione. So it'd be like a catalyst and you would just use it for a little bit and then you would stop. Um, so um, also if you combine liposomal glutathione and you also take benfotymine, then the NADPH can help restore your liposomal, liposomal glutathione that happens to be oxidized. So it could still be beneficial I'm not sold that it's not beneficial. It is my daughter's only way out because she does not make glutathione at all. Well, maybe a tiny bit. She doesn't make glutathione because of her genetic deletion. So I'm doing it. So wish me luck. <laughs> okay, so um, fresh animal sources of vitamin A for a buffer. We need retinol, just being honest. We can't go without it. It's crucial. Um, you can go for a certain time on the low vitamin A diet and be okay but then you'll find that you're not, um, how would I say it? You become restrictive on what you're able to eat because you can't run pyruvate dehydrogenase complex correctly. And so you're, you struggle with metabolism. And when you go outside of your typical diet, you can't use the nutrients. So you need some retinol, or I think your body's gonna make that bad guy, the beta 10 apocrotinol. All right. So you also need two, um, two eggs per day or 500 milligrams of phosphatidylcholine. Oh, on the betaine, don't, I need to say this, don't go above 250 to 500 milligrams of betaine in a day until you get a plasma amino acid test to check to see if you have high methionine levels, because there's a very rare, rare chance that you have a slow CBS enzyme. And if your CBS enzyme is very slow, you may have high methionine levels and that can lead to brain edema. So check your, <laughs> check your plasma amino acid test before you go higher than 500 milligrams per day in an adult or 250 milligrams per day in a child, because those are the amounts that have been used in studies where people don't usually get brain edema, but anything over a gram a day will cause brain edema in someone who has a CBS deficiency. Um, and then the downstream effect of betaine is that you, um, you require a little bit more B2 to try to help with the metabolism of the byproduct, which is sarcosine. Um, you wanna try to stay away from making sarcosine. You wanna push the byproducts down a different pathway, which is B2 dependent. All right, so back to the eggs. So two eggs per day or 500 milligrams of phosphatidylcholine choline will lessen the burden on ARAT and di, uh, I'm just gonna say DJAT. Gat. <laughs> um, interestingly, if you're having to use ARAT and DGAT because you don't have enough choline for LRAT, that's not a good thing. Those are your backup ways to deal with retinol. You, you really want to use your primary pathway. So you want to make sure that you have a source of choline. And also the phosphatidylcholine can restore cell membranes. And that's what helps to stop the leaking of the membranes. And leaking membranes alone leads to superoxide. And superoxide leads to the cells shutting down and making acetic acid. And acetic acid leads to anhydroretinol. All roads lead to anhydroretinol. <laughs> okay, so interestingly, y'all are gonna love this. All of you who lost your hair, if you're tying up DGAT, if you're using DGAT to tie up your retinol, DGAT deficiency causes alopecia. I actually might be famous. <laughs> so all those bald people out there, they actually just might be struggling with anhydroretinol. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm really sick. And so I, I'm actually more crazy when I'm sick. Okay. Um, 
we need phosphatidylcholine to spare ARAT and DGAT. That's our goal. We need PC for lecithin retinal acetyl transferase. Um, we, this is the phosphatidylcholine that's added onto the, the um, hydroxyl group over here to make a retinal ester. Um, okay, so it's again, I said it spares lipid membranes. Low PC intake is associated with fatty liver disease. So if you don't want fatty liver disease, make sure you get your phosphatidylcholine in. And PC supplements may help um, may help us with that, but they lack biotin and biotin is what we needed for the straw six pour. And that should probably be all capital letters there. But um, so eggs are a really good source of biotin. So just remember that biotin supplements can inhibit the absorption of pantothenic acid. And I think all of us are dying from pantothenic acid deficiency in varying amounts. So um, again, I think free range eggs are a good way to go because you get fresh source of retinol. Um, okay, so things to avoid. Sarcomyces, Sarcomyces boulardii, it makes alcohol more than candida. I can't believe we tell people to take that. Uh, okay, you want to maybe avoid spore-based bacillus subtilis because it metabolizes sulfate. And I really think we need the sulfate. We need it. Epsom salt baths will help though. Um, Anato and saffron, they contain apocarotinol. Anato is in a lot of things, lots as a coloring agent. It's in the cheddar cheese that's shredded and the regular block of cheddar cheese. So go for the, like the white cheddars because I am currently unsure how much apo or apocarotinol is contributing to people feeling bad. But vegans, um, you know, some vegans are thin and healthy and some vegans are overweight. And so what if the ones who are overweight are suffering from um, problems with their PDHC? Yeah. So they probably have a slow BCO1 and then that's making them make bad apocarotinols and that's causing this pathway. So if you're overweight and you're vegan, maybe you should stop. Okay. Um, um, avoid excess carotenoids if you know you have a slow BCO1. Avoid alcohol altogether. Also, a wine has sulfites in it and that makes the sulfite radical and that kills you. Okay future video on that. Okay. And then shelf stable foods with vitamin A added. Just be wary of anything that's fortified with vitamin A because how they make it could actually have also made some anhydro retinol. Um, you want to avoid skin products with retinol palmitate or retinol added. You want to avoid cheese or milk that's in clear containers. Try to get things that are not in clear containers. Uh, avoid cod liver oil because that's a big source of anhydro retinol. And um, you wanna avoid any competitors for AOX because I believe since this, um, when you see the other video, if you watch it, this puts the cell in a high NADH state. And so you do not metabolize retinal aldehyde with ALDH. Um, you actually struggle altogether, um, you know, to make retinal aldehyde, although beta carotene can come in and become retinal aldehyde, right? And that's not any D dependent. So um, maybe a small amount of beta carotene would be good, um, depending on if you have a slow BCO1 enzyme or not. Um, but it wouldn't be good if you're tying up your AOX, your backup enzyme for making retinoic acid. Um, so so AOX comp um, competition is from... Um, Oh, it, sorry, this is supposed to be an O again. I don't know why I'm stuck on it being a B. So it's going to be MO. It's molybdenum dependent, not MB dependent. Okay, so um, avoid high dose niacin, caffeine, and B6 supplements because like large dose B6 supplements. I think small dose would be okay. Like maybe up to five milligrams might be okay. But if you are using any of these supplements in large amounts or drinking caffeine in large amounts, you're tying up your AOX and that makes you less likely to make any retinoic acid and you need retinoic acid um, to be able to help with your, you know, upregulate antioxidant system. It, it helps to induce the gene transcription for some of these things that help you get rid of the reactive oxygen species. So that's super important. So what are the risks of the low vitamin A diet? Um, and that's the first thing that dietitians say, by the way, um, we say, oh, your vitamin A is high, just go low vitamin A. Well, the risk is that retinol is not a toxin. So a carnivore diet or a low carotenoid ketogenic diet or just a vitamin A free diet 
they, those diets aren't good because they avoid vitamin A and uh, meat just contains retinoic acid and retinoic acid can't be converted to retinol. So lack of retinoic acid, um, sorry, lack of retinol will leave PKC delta without a bridge for electron transport. So then you're stuck with a cell that doesn't have what it needs to have normal metabolism and you start to re, um, create reactive oxygen species. I think the cell might try to continue on around this and with the, the oxidative stress that's going on, it ends up making beta apotent carotenol from retinoic acid. And then that beta apotent carotenol will pathogenically turn on PKC delta. And so you're still stuck in the same cycle. You're stuck in the same cycle if you go low vitamin A. Without retinol to buffer, oxidative stress will continue to increase. And so you won't feel good. You're not getting better. It's not, it's not that detox is rough. No, it's you're retoxed. You're just retoxed with something different. So we need fresh retinol. And the big thing we have to do is mop up all the reactive oxygen species. And again, what saved the people, not the people, <laughs> wouldn't that be neat if it was a people study, but what saved the, the animals was vitamin E and coenzyme Q10. And I think that also we probably need to have some C on board to recycle the vitamin E. So, so future videos from the downstream effects, these are the things that are on my map and I will load my PDF my JPEG on my map onto my website and I'll link to it in the show notes so that you can um, you can go there and you can look at the map already. Um, I might not be able to answer questions right away through the email address that's on my blog because um, you know I'm just tired. So I'll make a video. Um, if you know me, you know, if if you want, you can post your questions in the vitamin A toxicity group too. That's fine. So um all right, so I'm gonna look at mast cell activated activation syndrome. M cause is definitely related to this anhydroretinol issue. Histamine intolerance, salicylate intolerance, all these things are linked to PKC delta. Um, dementia, um, you make A2E when you aren't, you know, you're kind of like stuck in this pathway with oxidative stress. Autism, of course, I've kind of already talked about that in, in previous blogs. Um, the loss of neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity, because if you have rehydroretinol, you don't make good retinoic acid and you need retinoic acid for neuroplasticity. So we're, our kids who have autism are struggling with this pathway and they're likely just very high on rehydroretinol, if not anhydroretinol. You end up with a retinoic acid deficiency due to AR in rehydroretinol and all of the sequelae that go along with it. Um, so you look like you're retinoic acid deficient. You probably have keratosis pleuris. So I'm going to probably make a video about that. Um, altered immune function. If you don't eat dietary retinol, you can't make retinoic acid in your gut. Dendritic cells make retinoic acid. Then they tell the B, they send it to the B lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes make IgA. And that helps keep you from having pathogenic gut bacteria and also from having candida. So going low retinol is not going to help this situation. Um, but if you have candida, whatever retinol you do eat becomes anhydro retinol possibly. So take care of your candida. Um, gout is related to this pathway too. Yeah. I can explain that in another video. Liver failure, kidney failure, diabetes, and alopecia. I am seriously going to be rich. <laughs> okay. And I think that is all. And, um, my daughter is very much awake. I didn't realize how long this video was going to take. So I'm going to go take care of her now and love to you all. And I hope this helps you. Um, please like, please subscribe, please share this video to help other people get out of the roads that lead to anhydroretinol. Bye. I have a hard time always stopping things. <laughs> There we go. There's the thing to stop it. Bye-bye. <laughs>